Many of you like the videos that we are doing. You appreciate the content. Well, because you do so, click the like button. And then you want to continue to get these videos coming your way. Well, it's good to press that subscribe button. And if you really want to get that information right as it is released, well, then press that notification button. Looking forward to seeing you again. Take care until next video. We are privileged as advertised to have a very special guest with us. Um, so we're very happy to have Dr. Steve Daly. And Dr. Steve Daly, he is a Christian uh, psychologist and um, former professor of UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. He also uh, was a professor at Loma Linda University or flagship university, and of course, La Sierra University also. Been a minister for approximately 35 years, and he is a scholar um, in the history of Ellen White. Of course, he would have done his um, thesis while doing his master's program on the writings of Ellen White, and um, he would have wrote his uh, doctoral uh, dissertation um, in the area of, of, of history. And also, uh, as I said, he is a psychologist. And so he wrote the book, the book Ellen White Psychobiography. And this evening, we want to be discussing with him uh, the contents of that book. And um, later on, as we come into the end of the program, we'll allow for us to just ask him a few questions that you know, we have in our hearts for quite a while that we've been waiting on the, the right person to share his knowledge to enlighten us on it. So at this time, I want to take the opportunity to welcome and to introduce to our platform this evening, Dr. Steve Daly. Thank you, Courtney. Good to be here. Thank you, Courtney. Yes, yes, yes. So I was asking the question, um, tell us, I mean, it has to be a journey, having worked for 35 years in the institution, and then you came to the point uh, where you wrote this book about Ellen G. White. So let us hear a little about your time in the church, the work that you did, and, and how it brought you to this point where you were able to, to write this book. Great. Sure. Thanks, Courtney. Um, I'll, I'll try to be real brief in my summary. I, I grew up in an Adventist home. Um, my dad wasn't particularly spiritual. Uh, we always joked that he married my mom in a shotgun wedding. Uh, she <laughs> insisted that he had to get baptized the day before they got married uh, for her to marry him. But she came from a conservative Adventist home. Her mother was an uh, Ellen White uh, fan to the max. Uh, every birthday and Christmas, she would give me Ellen White books, even when I was a little kid which I didn't particularly appreciate, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I love the God of sports. Uh, my dad was an athlete and um, he raised me up playing baseball, football and basketball. And I went to public schools early on. So I really worshiped the God of sports when I was young. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom wanted me to get all three of us boys. I was the oldest get transferred to Adventist schools. And uh, when that finally happened, when I was in junior high, that was the end of my sports career because uh, the Adventist schools had no sports program at that time. And Ellen White had condemned it and uh, they took that very seriously. So there was no inner school sports. Their, their sports facilities were worthless, the schools I went to. So I was a bit annoyed by that, to say the least, as a, a kid who loves sports so much. And I kind of had rebellious years there um, where I was quite angry with my folks for putting me in Adventist schools and, um, you know, angry at God for uh, taking away my sports world life as I saw it. But um, growing up in Adventism, I never felt that I'd be good enough. You know, my my teachers, Sabbath school teachers and teachers and the Adventist schools were always about perfectionism and you couldn't sin after your name came up in the investigative judgment and all this stuff that was so discouraging to me that I knew I didn't have a 
prayer anyway. So I wasn't really into the religious stuff much. And uh, when I was 16, God encountered me, gave me an actual experience with him where I knew he was real. And I realized he loved me in spite of my rebellion. And, and that just completely changed my life. And uh, I went to Real Indo Academy after that and decided I wanted to go into the ministry. I, I had a lot of friends getting kicked out of the school because of all the rules and regulations. This was right in the middle of the baby boom. And I really felt that the church wasn't very user friendly for its young people. And I went into the ministry hoping to try to change that and uh, became chaplain at La Sierra University shortly after I was um, in out of seminary and uh, did my best to try to, I wrote the book Adventism for a New Generation, which had quite an impact on the church um, for many years. It was used as a textbook in a lot of our colleges and universities. And um, so, you know, I was doing my best to try to make Adventism more gospel fo focused, more Christ centered, uh, more spirit led, more uh, friendly to the young people, less rule bound, less attached to law. Um, and those were the kinds of things I tried to do during my ministry. I, I was not a professor, I was on the faculty. I taught every, every year, every quarter of my uh, 60 quarters there at La Sierra. So I uh, actually more than 60 because I taught summer schools too. So I was a, a full faculty at, in the School of Religion and I also taught in history and in psychology in all three areas. Uh, during my 20 years there. And then I taught four more years uh, at Loma Linda University. So I, I had plenty of university teaching, but I wasn't like a tenured professor. And, and when I went to UCLA, I worked for them as a psychologist. I was not a professor on the faculty, just so you understand that. But, um, you know, I, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't always... Uh, feel that Ellen White was very reliable um, in the years that I didn't refer to her in my sermons. I, I generally uh, didn't talk about her much in my classes unless I was teaching a course on Adventist history or on Ellen White herself. But, um, you know, I knew there were a lot of problems. Um, the 1919 Bible Conference minutes were discovered in 1974. And um, Ron Numbers wrote his book, Prophetess of Hell, shortly after that. Walter Ray wrote his book a few years later. So I was very aware of the problems with Ellen White. But um, I tried to extend as much grace to her as possible and, you know, tried to, uh, when I did research, uh, it was always specific research. Uh, my master's thesis in history was on the 1919 Bible Conference and Ellen White. My doctoral dissertation at Claremont was uh, called The Irony of Adventism. And it was on Ellen White compared to the role of other women in the Adventist church, which was a very fascinating topic. I wrote two books called The Prophetic Rift before the psychobiography. And those were both books that looked at Ellen White and her influence decade by decade in relation to Adventist history. But um, I left the Adventist church in 2010. Uh, the congregation I was pastoring at that time was Celebration Center. And there was uh, an issue that came up in the church and um, it was quite divisive to the church. It involved uh, two staff members on our uh, pastoral staff. And um, you know, the church was quite divided over this. I won't go into details about what it involved, but it was something that they did that had legal implications and problems. And um, I, I tried to follow exactly uh, what was ethical and right and talked with them and talked with the conference and the conference felt they had to fire them. Um, and, you know, this was very divisive because they had friends and family in the church and on the board and so it was quite messy and, and we were trying to get through all of this uh and the conference president came and 
told the, uh, the church business meeting that uh, they were not going to try to take their senior pastor away. Don't worry about it. And then the very next day, he told me that they would be moving me from celebration. So he directly lied to the church business meeting. And that really made a lot of people very angry. And they said, we've had enough with Adventism. We're going to leave. And uh, we want you to pastor our church. And I said, I'm ready to leave too. I, I can't put up with much more of this church politics and craziness and dishonesty. And it had just been a whole lifetime of having to deal with this in my career. And um, so I started pastoring Kingdom Life Fellowship, which is now called Graceway Community Church. It's been going for uh, 12 years. Um, and, and I didn't really feel like I would have anything to do with Adventism after leaving the Adventist church. But then in 2012, uh, the White Estate was hacked. I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, an insider helped uh, these hackers get in and, and reveal documents that had always been withheld uh, dishonestly because they told us as researchers that we had access to everything. But this was some very sensitive material about Ellen White's drunkenness, her, her addiction to alcohol, her statements about God hating children. There were just a whole bunch of things that were just really despicable. And when I became aware of these statements that had been withheld from me as a researcher, I was quite unhappy about it. And I decided I would do one more uh, book and I would ask the question if the, um, you know, extensive accusations of fraud and pathology that had been leveled against Ellen White during her lifetime and after her lifetime, if these could stand up to historical and psychological scrutiny. So that's really the, the subject and focus of my psychobiography. And, um, I had to answer both questions, yes, that certainly uh, Ellen was guilty of incredible fraud when you look at all the source documents and look at everything involved. And uh, she was also uh, troubled with some major pathology. Uh, both of those things, when you read my book, are well documented. And um, it wasn't a happy conclusion for me. I, you know, I grew up with Ellen White as a spiritual mother. I never had uh, resentment or anger towards her kind of the way Walter Ray did because he felt that he had really been deceived and preached Ellen White all his life and then found out it was a lie. I never did preach Ellen White. I, I never did feel Ellen White was right about everything. I never did believe that she was infallible in any way, shape, or form, or inspired in any way that rivaled the Bible. So, you know, I, I wasn't invested in Ellen White the way Walter Ray was. But um, doing the research for this last book, it was very troubling to see how deceptive she was, what, what the patterns of fraud and deception that followed her throughout her lifetime, how extensive those patterns were and deep those patterns were. And it was, uh, you know, troubling to me to say the least. I, I had already left the church, so it wasn't something that uh, caused me any kind of identity crisis because I wasn't an Adventist anyway. But um, I did realize that, you know, the church has never been accountable either for what Ellen White did or for what the church has done to cover up what she did and what the White estate has done to lie about what she did and they themselves have done in terms of deception. So, um, uh, yeah, the other Steve, could, could you go back a bit, um, like in her early days and bring us, bring us forward into uh, the significant role she would have played as the, the prophetess of the organization back with um, Joseph Bates and, and, and James White, and, and, you know, in terms of some of these things that she would have done coming forward. Yes. Know? Yeah. Yes, that's really the most critical period when you look at Ellen White. Uh, 
you know, the first seven years are the most damning years as far as the evidence and the um, source documentation is concerned. Let me give a little background before she became an Adventist, because this, I think, will help people understand who she was. She was a, a fraternal twin. They were the youngest of eight children. It was a very busy home. Um, this was back, they started out as a rural family, uh, living on a farm and had plenty of work to do. And the kids didn't get a whole lot of attention. And then they moved to the city and the father had his own hat making business. So it was a very busy family. And um, what's fascinating about Ellen's childhood is that she had an abnormal amount of fear. She was a very fearful child, even before she had the rock injury to her head. Um, she was suicidal. She was so filled with fear that she would talk about uh, wanting to die, but afraid she was lost and for eternity. And uh, she had this incredible fear of God and it, it was quite interesting because she came from a Methodist family that wasn't super religious. And, uh, you know, so you have to ask the question, where did she get this intense fear? None of her other seven siblings seemed to have this kind of intense fear. And uh, her depression and stuff was only accentuated after her head injury at the age of nine. And this is often misunderstood. You know, many people think it was a brain injury, but it really wasn't a brain injury. The, the friend that threw the rock that hit her in the top of the nose badly broke her nose, but it didn't initially knock her out. It just fractured her nose. And uh, she continued walking home. And it was only when the swelling went up into her brain that she fainted and and had to be uh, helped, carried home. And, and then she went into this three week uh, coma. And, you know, it took quite a while for that extensive brain swelling, the swelling that went into the brain to go back down. But once it did, she healed up. Uh, she didn't, she wasn't deformed for life or anything like some people try to say. She didn't have any permanent brain damage at all. Um, you know, I do not believe her visions were the result of complex seizures, as some Adventist doctors have tried to imply. Um, you know, I, I think it was a very serious injury, and their medical uh, skills back then weren't what they are today. So they did have fears that she was going to die when she was in that extended coma and stuff. But the the notion that she had permanent brain damage and that was responsible for her problems the rest of her life really just won't hold up to uh, scrutiny. It won't hold up to the historical evidence. And I don't think it will hold up to the medical evidence either. But um, but that injury certainly did affect her greatly. It it put her out of school. Uh, she, she looked so terrible that when her father came home from a trip, he didn't recognize her. That was very traumatic to her. Uh, she had, incredible depression connected with that injury where she wanted to die. Uh, she wanted to die very badly, but she was afraid she was lost for eternity. Again, she had this fear coupled with a lot of depression. And um, as she tried to sort through all this, she came to realize that she was getting tremendous attention uh, because of the injury that she had never gotten before. She was kind of the centerpiece of attention in the family now because everyone was worried she was going to die. And so uh, she came to realize that she no longer had to perform uh, typical female roles, the chores. She was now bedridden much of the time. She was given a lot of attention. I really believe that it was during this period that she came to learn how to manipulate her own family so that she was the center of attention. And um, I talk about this in the chapter of my book called Creative Malady. And it, it talks about how many, many people have creative maladies that they use either consciously or subconsciously 
to their own benefit. And I show in the book how Ellen White certainly did this. And it was also during this period that she became more spiritual and wanted to try to find God in a way that will be more healthy than her fear and dread that she'd experienced so much before. And she got involved in a group called the Shouting Methodists. They were kind of a, I wouldn't call them an offshoot of Methodism, but they were a fanatical fringe of Methodism that were into the most charismatic extremes you can possibly imagine. And uh, they had these camp meetings where they would all scream and shout and scream like animals and crawl all over. And they just had the most bizarre kind of uh, charismatic activities that they would be involved with. And they had what they called these shouting rings. And uh, they believed that no one could be saved without a shouting ring. So the preachers would come in, the Methodist uh, preachers would come in and they couldn't be heard because they didn't have microphones in those days because all these rings were shouting as loud as they could, trying to shout down the devil, shout down the Holy Spirit. Uh, <laughs> it, it was just chaotic. Uh, and, and Ellen got baptized into this form of Methodism and actually became quite prominent. Even at the age of 15, she was recognized as having these visions. And um, so she was claiming to be a visionary even then. And um, it was quite a, uh, as I say, chaotic and I think even demonic kind of thing that was going on there because uh, the preachers couldn't preach, uh, the rings were teaching it didn't matter if a preacher preached or not. The only way a person could be saved was through the ring. So it was really salvation by works and salvation by shouting and salvation by all these charismatic excesses and extremes. So it was quite a bizarre movement. And it's, it's a fascinating study in and of itself. But Ellen White came to get a spiritual identity through these meetings and... Um, you know, you've probably heard of the the meetings where she, uh, the police came in and they were arrested. Uh, the leader was arrested for disturbing the peace and Ellen was heavily involved with all that. And so Spectrum ran a bunch of articles about these meetings and Fred Hoyt, who was one of my professors at La Sierra, he, he did the original research that found out about these meetings in Portland, Maine, where uh, the police came in and arrested them for disturbing the peace. And it, it was, uh, you know, they were just guilty of the most ridiculous kind of charismatic stuff at that point. And I bring this up because Ellen would later become so condemning of anything charismatic, which is quite ironic that she was so heavily involved in charismatic fanaticism herself. And then she became so intolerant of it later on. But it was this experience with uh, the shouting Methodists and these uh, very fanatical groups that gave Ellen the idea that she was special and that God was somehow using her and somehow giving her visions or trances or uh, these kinds of things. And, and she wasn't claiming to have the kind of specific visions then that she would later claim in Adventism. But she was only 17 years old after the Great Disappointment. And, um, you know, here you had a small circle of adults who were absolutely devastated. They were emotionally completely at their wits end. They were hopeless. They didn't know where to turn. So here's this 17 year old girl claiming to have a vision from God. And this kind of gives them hope. Oh, maybe God is speaking to us through this young girl. Well, we know that that first vision was plagiarized. It was plagiarized from Joseph Turner. Uh, he had the very content of her vision was written in a paper by Joseph Turner uh, shortly before she had the vision, and the paper was in her home. Her home father had brought it home, and um, after she claimed to have her vision, Joseph Turner talked to her and said, uh, "This is I understand this is what you saw in the vision. She said, yes. He said, well, that's exactly 
what I put in my paper uh, that I presented. And uh, she said, oh, I never read it. And he goes, oh, that's amazing uh, that God would give us both the same thing. Well, we know she did read it, and we know that um, this was a pattern her entire lifetime. She would read things, copy them, plagiarize them, and then claim that she had never read the books or read the materials when she was seen to have done so by uh, Dr. Kellogg and many others. And, and it's proven from the sources that she copied from word for word. And, uh, you know, Ron Numbers proved this with her health stuff many years ago, um, that it, it was, she would make gross mistakes. So it couldn't have been something that was given her by God. It was, she was teaching health principles about vital force and all kinds of things, phrenology, et cetera, that were 100% untrue. And she was claiming she didn't get these from human books, even though she was copying word for word from them. And the material was completely false. So the Adventist idea that God only showed her what to copy from books and this kind of thing is really nonsense. Because again and again and again, we find that she plagiarized from books material that was wrong, historically inaccurate, medically inaccurate, all kinds of mistakes that she attributed to God when we know that she got them from these sources. And we can go back and see word for word or paragraph for paragraph or paraphrase for paraphrase exactly where she took these materials. So. You know, the idea that Ellen was innocent, uh, you know, when you talk about authenticity, um, unfortunately, it just won't stand up to the evidence. Um, and these first seven years were really the work. Yeah, um, this first seven year period was very pivotal because even in that first vision, Ellen claimed that God showed her the exact uh, hour and day of his coming, um, which, of course, wasn't true. Um, she taught the shut door. It's very interesting that this vision came just a couple months after the great disappointment. And, um, you know, again, the people were so distraught and they were so uh, hopeless and needing something that... Uh, the initial reaction of the Millerites, including William Miller himself, was to teach the shut door thing, the shut door theology that uh, even though the Lord didn't return, probation was closed and anyone who had not accepted their message was lost for eternity. Well, William Miller quickly saw that that wasn't true. You know, he, that was just a reaction to them being wrong. So he, he gave that up along with all his followers. But, and, and many in the Ellen White group were thinking of doing the same, but it's interesting that this first vision she had cemented the shut door teaching. It showed uh, them going up this narrow little path. And if anyone gave up their teaching, they would fall off and be lost for eternity along with the whole wicked world that was lost which is what she said in the vision. So she was saying the whole wicked world was lost. Everyone was lost for eternity except their tiny little group. And if any of them gave up on the shut door teaching, they would be lost for eternity too. So it was this first vision of Ellen's that really cemented the shut door teaching. And this went on for the next seven years. Ellen White again and again and again would teach that uh, the door was shut and they had different uh, versions of this. The first version was that the whole world was lost except for their tiny little group. And then a few years later, they had a couple people, a small number of people come and say, hey, what, what's your group about? We wanna, we wanna check it out. And so they said, okay, well, did were you involved with the Miller Millerite movement? And if they said no, then they said, well, then you're not damned for eternity then. Uh, the only ones that are damned for eternity are the ones who knew about the 1844 message and rejected it. So they changed the shut door from the whole world being damned and lost 
to only those who rejected the Millerite message were lost. So that was version number two of the shut door. And then as you get um, into 1849, Ellen all along this period was teaching that the Lord was coming back any time. But in 1848, um, Joseph Bates came up with what was called the seven year theory. This was his own theory. And he believed that the Lord would return on October 22, 1851, exactly seven years after the great disappointment. And James White wasn't totally convinced by this, but Ellen was, and she claimed to have visions showing um, in 1850 and 1851 that there were only a few months left before the Lord was going to return. So she became very specific in the things she was saying about the uh, shut door and about the close of probation and um, Here's one of the quotes. Some of us have had time to get the truth and to advance step by step. This is um, early writings, page 67. And to advance step by step. And every step we've taken has given us strength to take the next. But now time is almost finished. And what we have been years learning, they will have to learn in just a few months. Uh, they will also have much to unlearn and much to learn again. So this is uh, shortly before the seven year theory is over and Ellen saying probation is even to close for them now uh, because um, the seven year theory is just about to be fulfilled and, and uh, the time of trouble is upon them. And, and uh, so she's even being as specific as saying there's only a few months left before uh, Jesus returns. And so, you know, she also says that if you rejected her view of the shut door, you were guilty of the unpardonable sin. Um, there, there's just a whole bunch of quotes here that are really fascinating, all having to do with the shut door. And I don't want to have to read them all, but they're all delineated in the book with all the references. And, um, you know, her accompany angel is showing her all this. So, there's no question about the fact that she's claiming that God is showing her all this stuff. And, um, you know, I saw that Jesus prayed for his enemies, but that should not cause us to pray for the wicked world whom God has rejected. When he prayed for his enemies, there was hope for them and they could be benefited and saved by his prayers. Uh, but that was not the case. There's no mediator, she's saying now. Um, the world is condemned and lost. So basically, um, you know, here's another one about, uh, then I saw the Laodiceans. There they admit that the door of salvation is shut. The sin against the Holy Ghost was to ascribe to Satan what belongs to God or what the Holy Ghost has done. They said the shut door was of the devil and now admit it is against their own lives. They shall die the death. So she's saying here, anyone who opposed her shut door teaching, it committed the unpardonable sin and that they were dead for eternity. They will die the death, they were lost. Uh, they're, <laughs> they'd committed the unpardonable sin against the Holy Spirit for opposing her view of the shut door that's saying that everyone's been damned in the whole world except for their tiny little group. So this is about as cultic as you can get. The seven years of her teaching the shut door is just the most cultic stuff imaginable. Uh, it's our tiny little group alone that can be saved. The whole world's been condemned. Uh, their probation's closed. They're lost for eternity. Anyone who questions this doctrine has committed the unpardonable sin, even in our group. So you know, this shut door stuff was just so embarrassing that when 1851 passed, October 22, and the seven year theory didn't get fulfilled, uh, James was really quite upset because, as I say, he hadn't been as convinced by Bates. And he was so embarrassed by Ellen's claim visions on these things 
that he refused to publish any more of her visions in the Review and Herald. He was the Review and Herald editor at that time. So he never did uh, again print one of her visions, which he'd been doing freely before that. They also went back, James and Ellen together, along with Bates, and they deleted all the shut door comments, statements out of their books, out of their writings. They didn't make any uh, confession about them being wrong or that they'd been taken out. They simply just removed all these materials and went on printing the uh, books and pamphlets as if that was their original uh, way that they had appeared, which was just grossly dishonest. It was uh, censorship, deletion, lying about what they'd done, what they'd said. Uh, so all the evidence about the shut door and the seven year theory was basically buried at the same time that Ellen White's writing or her visions were no longer being put in the church paper because a lot of people were really upset about this. And what made it worse was that in 1849, Ellen claimed she was getting visions from God, showing her that the believers were to sell their homes and all their possessions and give the money to the cause, the cause being their little church, um, which wasn't organized or structured or legal at that time. But um, the cause was really the money was going to James and Ellen. And ironically, they bought their first home with the monies that came in from people being told that God was telling them to sell their homes because time was so short. So Ellen and James are getting wealthier while everyone else is selling, you know, anyone who believed what she said was selling their homes and selling their possessions and and then when the Lord didn't return, Ellen didn't do anything to help these people. She didn't refund these people. You know, she, her and James kept the money. They bought a nice home, which was supposed to be a, a church home, but they are the ones that kept the deed. They're the ones that own the property. Uh, it, the, it, the property was never given to the church. There was a lot of financial fraud that James was involved with. And he was accused of embezzlement even in these early years. The messenger party that left the church in 1853 left over two reasons, Ellen's false visions that were proven to be false and James's embezzlement and financial mismanagement. And uh, they had all this documented and proven even at a very early age or stage in the, in the movement's uh, history. Uh, Steve, so, uh, yeah. Ah, one uh, one thing I want I want to be able to ask you um, how we did eventually get uh, Sabbath into the church um, at, at the time of Ellen G. White and Day. But be before you answer that, there are some folks uh, who would say that um, we don't have a problem with Ellen G. White's writing. One is really how people interpret her writing. Um, her writings are good. It's just that people uh, put a lot of um, emphasis on it, uh, putting it alongside the Bible, but, but she never did that. And then the other thing they would say is that uh, people are interfering with, um, with her writings, um, putting things in her writings to make her look bad, and taking away things from her writings to also make her look bad. So essentially, the original stuff that Ellen White would have written, um, we don't have it anymore because the, those that are published are not accurately representing her. So, so how do you respond to people who are saying that her writings, they are good, and by and large, they are misrepresented in some form or fashion? And then you could probably just segue into the, the, the whole question about Sabbath, how important and when it, when it came into the church. Good. Yeah. Um, of course, the Adventist Reform Group uh, claims Ellen White was this pristine person and the White estate is responsible for all the problems and errors and inaccuracies. This kind of teaching is just completely absurd because the White estate wasn't around for years. When I go back and look at the source documentation that we have from the very beginning, these are Ellen White's words themselves. 
They're nothing to do with the white estate. They're nothing to do with someone else putting words in her mouth. These are her words. And uh, part of what I have here is 25 statements Ellen White makes and claims for her own writings. And um, the nature of these claims, many of which are just plain blasphemous. Most Adventists aren't aware of this, but that's why I uh, compiled all 25 of these quotes. Uh, she makes absolute claims for herself. 5T67, in these letters I write, in the testimonies I bear, I am presenting to you that which the Lord has presented to me. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. If uh, 1SM46, if they, her testimonies, are not heeded, the Holy Spirit is shut away from the soul. That's just blasphemous. To say if my writings are not heeded as a human being, that the Holy Spirit is shut away from your soul is a blasphemous claim for any human being to make. To call yourself the spirit of prophecy is a blasphemous claim. And Ellen White refers to herself this way. This was not just a term that was put on her by the church. She's the one that originated it. Um, when I send you a testimony, 5T661, when I send you a testimony of warning and reproof, many of you declare it merely the opinion of Sister White. You have thereby insulted the Holy Spirit of God. So to insult her is to insult is to insult the spirit of God. You know, that is blasphemy. If I say for you to insult me is to insult God or the Holy Spirit or the spirit of God, that is blasphemy. No human being can put themselves on the level of God. Uh, 3SM 32, 52, the testimonies never contradict his word. There is one straight train of truth without one heretical sentence in that which I have written. Well, that's just a complete lie. There's all kinds of things Ellen White wrote that were wrong, that were inaccurate, that were blasphemous, that were, you know, racist. <laughs> it's just ridiculous uh, for her to make these kinds of statements. If you lose confidence in the testimonies, you will drift from Bible truth. In other words, if you don't have confidence in her writings, you can't uh, follow the Bible. Uh, I mean, th these are ridiculous claims for a human being to make. God does nothing in partnership with Satan. My work for the past 30 years bears the stamp of God or the stamp of the enemy. There is no halfway in the matter. Ellen White is the one that forces people into this absolute dichotomy. You either have to accept everything she says of God. To contribute to this ministry, check the description below. Many of you like the videos that we are doing. You appreciate the content, or right? because you do so, click the like button. And then you want to continue to get these videos coming your way. Well, it's good to press that subscribe button. And if you really want to get that information right as it is released, and then press that notification button. Looking forward to seeing you again. Take care until next video.